What do you do when you come into a dead end street? Everything in your life all of a sudden stops and there doesn't seem to be any hope and the only road seems to be that of perhaps even ending your life in deep, deep depression. Today we live with the promise of hope in God. Hi, I'm Father Mike Manning. I'm a Catholic priest. Thank you very much for tuning in. I am delighted to be able to come to you with some of my thoughts about the presence of God in our life. Um, you know, I think that we all run into serious problems in our lives, things that seem like dead-end streets, walls that you can't even get over. Maybe it's something that is burning in our own hearts, or maybe it's something that someone else says or someone else does, we lose our job, you know? we lose our, our respect and our honor. And the real question comes, what could God do to get me out of this terrible, terrible situation of almost insurmountable problems? Well, I'd like to talk to you about that because I really think that the whole basis of the Bible, the whole basis of our faith is that when things seem to be totally, totally ended and, and finished and dreams that we had, had, we had hoped, whoom, they're cut short, there's a faith in God that brings us a promise of something more. Now, in order to make the point, uh, let me tell you a story. Um, it's a story about a, a young man by the name of Van. Um, uh, Van was a Marine. He joined the Marines shortly after high school, and oh, he loved it, he loved it. And not only did he just love it, but there were some real positive things that happened, and the recruiter was continually telling him this, that he could be able, after he finished his term of commitment in the service, to get a full education in college, and boom. And especially when you hear about the amount of money that people go into debt today with our college problems, you know, whoa, this was very attractive. And then also found out that he could get up to $25,000, a check that would come to him if he was willing to make this commitment to the armed services. You know. And in addition to that, he was going to get medical care for the rest of his life. You know, he would be able to go to the, to the military hospitals. And not only was it those practical things like college, money, and medical care, but there was a certain glory about being a soldier, the, the, the swagger with which you could see them walking down the street or at the airports. Um, there was also a, an attraction to this thing of discipline. Um, the, the, that, that was neat. There was, there was an order that came with his life in, in the Army, or as a Marine, that kind of gave him a security. You, you knew where you were supposed to go and where you were not supposed to go, and who you listened to and who you didn't listen to, and it was just very, he just had to say yes, or he just had to say no, and things were very clear for him. But then, the thing that, that grew on him as he made this commitment, and the bond with the military service became more and more, was the bond of friendship, the friendship with the fellow, fellow young men that he was serving with. Oh, they didn't know each other before, but when they went through basic training, even though he loved that basic training, the, the anguish and the, and the struggle and the sweat and the pain, and also the continual need to support one another when things didn't go right, they, the bond that they found was really, really strong in his life. And he knew that this is where he wanted to be. You know? Well, in the midst of this great love for the military, he met Helen, a young girl who lived just about three miles outside a side of the base where, the, uh, where we had his basic training. He fell in love with Helen, and um, Helen got pregnant. Even though they weren't married, she got pregnant. 
Well, it was at this time that he began some of his deployments, and I'd like to move to the third deployment that he had in Afghanistan. By this time, Helen has had a, a little boy, a, a beautiful little boy, and but uh, oh, uh, Van is having, having to spend the majority of his time over in Afghanistan in the deployments that he has, and the, the contacts are through telephone calls or Skype messages, but it was very distant from that. Van loved this, and his officers saw that, and they saw his love of discipline and his love of organization, and you know what they did? They started raising him up in rank, and pretty soon he was a, a sergeant in the Marines. Well, let me now tell you the story that in many ways turned his life around. Um, while in deployment in Afghanistan, uh, one evening they got a call to go into a village where they thought that there were some Taliban people. Well, he got his seven soldiers, and again, they were all, they were all, uh, you know, they were wearing the helmet, and they had the night goggles, and they had the, the all the, the instruments to try to keep them safe if they, anything was shot. And they moved rather stealthily, but not too concerned, because it, it wasn't a big thing of, of that, but he needed to get into that, into that village and to search out some of the Taliban. Well, what happened was, and that, that night, and as they looked out at that little village, and it was no more than maybe, oh, maybe 10 little huts, it seemed so innocuous, it didn't seem to be very serious, they moved ahead. But you know what happened? The village was set on the side of two hills, and as soon as they got into the, into the front of the village, oh, the Taliban from both sides just opened up with fire. They were driving in a truck, and as soon as the firing start, some of them tried to get out of the truck and to move behind some of the stones, but there were three of them that weren't able to do that, and they sh shot one of those, those, rocket, those rockets right at it and blew up, and three of the seven soldiers, bam, were killed right away. Well, the only thing that they could do was try as best they could to get into one of these homes these little little wood homes where they were living, and boy, they came in there, and Van got in there, and so the other men were there, the three others, and then himself. But just as he was trying to get into the door, a bullet hit him right in the knee. Oh, and it was a it was a vicious, vicious shot that shattered bone right at, right at the center of his kneecap. Well, he he crawled in, and the and the others grabbed him and brought him in, and there he was, just in oh extreme pain. But he was a Marine, and he knew that he had to hold on for that. And they came into that house, and as they were there trying to get it up, all of a sudden they looked and they saw two figures. Their guns came up right away, and they saw that it was a woman, and on next to her was a little boy. And uh, well, they looked at her, and she looked at them, and uh, then they didn't know what to do, so they came over and they tried to make sure that she didn't have any bombs or there were, there were no, nothing to, to harm them in the room. And he was lying there and, oh, the pain was great, and the problem was that he was bleeding to death. Something strange happened. Now here I've got to explain to you also that in this shooting of the car, or, or the, of the truck where they came, their communication was gone. And now they were alone in this place, not able to get back in touch with the base and see if maybe they could get some people to come and get them. So there he is in this place, and oh my, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a dead-end street. And he's really thinking that if he is ever going to exist, he's probably going to have to have his leg amputated. This young man, this young father, this, this exciting, idealistic person was going to have to have his leg amputated. And you know what happened? The woman, a young woman, probably similar in age to him, came over, and first he, he kind of pulled back, but she reached out with loving, caring hands and she started to wrap his leg and to try as best she could to overcome the, the blood that was coming out. And some of, her, some of her expertise, some of her natural talent was able to stop the bleeding that was going on. 
He lay down and she was caring for him. But then, oh gosh, you're, th this is what was so terrible. Just at that time, the little boy you know, had stood up and he walked across one of the open window areas and a bullet came in and shot him right in the head and he was killed right on the spot. The mother, of course, screamed in angry and came over and held the, held the boy and just, and just prayed and, and, and cried out with the anguish as she looked at a, at a head that had just been blown off. Well, eventually after four hours, uh, um, there did come a rescue. Helicopters came and were able to clear the, the people that had shot the, the ambush and they were able to get in. They put, they put him right into the, in, into the helicopter and were able to send him off. He came back home um, and of course he was there. But you know what they had to do? They did have to amputate his leg. His life back home was completely turned around. The memories of that, that terrible ambush, the memories of the death plagued him. Uh, he feared to talk about it. He, he wouldn't talk with anyone, not with his, with his wife, not with his child. And he couldn't sleep at night either. He was continually plagued with this terrible thought of that thing happening again. But then, but then, in the midst of all of that dead-end street, Ophelia, who was his wife, came to him and prayed with him. She prayed with him. And not only that, she took him in her arms, especially after one of those nights when he had been sweating and, and crying out because of a, a nightmare that he had happened. And she held him. And she said some beautiful words to him, taken from the gospel of, or the, the letter of Paul to the Romans. God is kind. God is forbearing. God is patient. Those little moments, those little moments of grace turned his life around. He started to talk. He started to share in that those memories of suicide and the depression and hopelessness were overcome by the love and the care that Ophelia gave him. And through that was a deep experience of a God who gave him hope on a dead end street. I am very excited to tell you about a book that I've just written. It's a book for children, and it's a Christmas book. And it's called The Cow, the Wolf, and Lupe. I know that if you were able to get this book and to go through it and perhaps sit down with a little child and read it, that the wonders of Christmas are going to just fill their heart and fill your heart, too, with many blessings. Now, what, what's this story all about? Let me just give you the general outline without perhaps bringing in some of the strong conclusions that are going to happen. It's the story of um, the little girl who was the daughter of the innkeepers in Bethlehem. She gives her insight into just what happened. Then we move on to the cow in the manger. You well, we haven't thought about that. But the cow, she tells us exactly what happened on that very precious night of the nativity. But then, well, I guess this is the really my favorite one. It's the wolf who's out in the middle of the field stalking the lambs, thinking about lamb chops, wanting to get lamb chops, when all of a sudden the angels come and the, the singing comes, the shepherds run away, and in a marvelous, marvelous, touching experience, the little girl, the cow, and the wolf all come together. Now, this book is going to cost $8 plus shipping and handling, and if you'd like to have the video of the program, it's another $2. Now please, get in touch, write us, and remember, 
you can call that telephone number right at the bottom of your screen. Make sure that you give this special gift to those little children that you love so very much. God bless you. We can live in a world in which we're overcome with hopelessness. Uh, all you got to do is look at CNN or look at Fox or look at any of these news programs and time and again we hear the stories of people whose lives have been just completely turned upside down and filled with tragedy. I, I, I think of the very high statistic of teenagers and business people and military people coming back from the war in Iraq and, and Afghanistan who commit suicide. Yeah. Ooh, suicide is so, so <laughs> serious, you know? I mean, that's the end of it all. And then the people, and oh gosh, you, you and I both know that we get the, the verdict from the doctor that there's cancer, or that there's a heart problem, or that there's some disease that is suddenly going to end their life and all of the aspirations and things that we had wanted to do and the word from the doctor that we have only a certain amount of weeks or a certain amount of months or even a year changes us completely. And can you remember this, this, this tsunami that came with, um, to Japan? I, 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 I was fascinated as I looked at the, the, not only the big television program uh, camera work of that, but Many people who just with the cameras on their phone or small cameras showed the terror of what happens. Recently I was looking at a, of a scene where this cameraman was standing on a hill and he was looking down and here were maybe 10 people and among them were old women and they were screaming in terror because the wave of the tsunami was coming on and he was taking the picture and you could see this wall of destruction coming, and you could see these people running as fast as they could, and many of them, because they were older, just couldn't do that, and they were swept up, wow, into the force of that tsunami. You know? Well, what about all these fires that come, homes that are destroyed, lives that are destroyed, and when? And when, when you think of the homes, you're thinking of everything. Just the other day, I heard of a, a fire down in Texas, and this young lady was saying that we had no chance to pick up anything, whether it was family pictures or clothes or whatnot. All she had was the clothes on her back, and they had to run away. And when she came back, after several days, ashes. <laughs> everything was gone. Well, as we talk about this, the, the big question comes, for me especially, is what does God have to say about this? What does God have to say about these overwhelmingly destructive things that happen in our life? Is there any message where we could find God giving us hope? Now, if you get a chance, look through the Bible. And what you find in the Bible is, time and again, people who have run into dead-end streets who are able to find blessing and care from what happens. Oh, just haphazardly. Remember Joseph, uh, Joseph, the, one of the 12 sons. He, um, he sold off into slavery. You know, his, his brothers were just so jealous of him that they sell him off into slavery. That's a dead-end street, you know, from living as being the favorite child of my father and everything going well, whoa, his life was completely turned around and he was sold off as a slave. But we know the story that eventually his father was able to receive him back and there was a reconciliation with the people that had sold him and there was a blessing that came even further than he imagined. That's the Bible. Tragedies? and answers that bring us great hope. Well, the tragedy of the Jews who'd been freed from Egypt, you know, they'd been freed from Egypt, Moses says, come on, come on, we're gonna go. But then all of a sudden we find that Pharaoh has changed his mind and is wanting to come right back and get them. And so they're running, and what do they do? They run into this, this sea, 
and there's no escape. And the story is the story of hope for you and me as we go through all of these insurmountable obstacles and tragedies. That the sea was open <laughs> and the people were able to walk through the sea dry shod. What about Gideon? Remember old Gideon? That's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Gideon is this forgotten, forgotten person of this one tribe of Israel that God comes to him and says, I want you to be the mighty warrior to go against the Medians who are terrorizing your people. Well, Gideon is just this kind of, you know, kind of mousy guy who doesn't know what. And he said, no, you, you are the great one. Well, the story ends up that with only 350 people, because of God's blessing in him, he's able to overcome an army of 100,000 enemy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. It's crazy, isn't it? That's the story of God, and I want you to hear these stories, no matter what's going on in your life. And I mentioned some of them with regard to CNN and Fox News and whatnot, that we hear these stories. But you have your own story. There are things that are going on in your life that are very difficult. And ooh, that old cry comes up sometimes, Lord, where are you and what am I going to do? And the possibility of suicide, the possibility of deep depression, the possibility of hopelessness is all around us. And I want to shout to you, I want to shout to you the power of God's love and the power of being able to know we are people of faith. When you get to the New Testament, you run into some interesting dead-end streets. There's a woman who has been caught in the act of adultery, and according to the law of Moses, she should be stoned. And two people come and catch her in the act of adultery. They grab her out of the bed, and they lead her to Jesus. And the moment is a moment of hopelessness. <laughs> Everything is clear. They had two witnesses that she was sleeping with someone else. She was, a, she was an adulteress, and she is going to be stoned, the end of the world. And Jesus came, and suddenly, with understanding and care, she was freed from that, that condemnation of death. And all he said was, don't, don't do that sin anymore. What about the hopelessness, remember, of the widow at Nain? Um, Jesus was walking in a valley not very far from his hometown of Nazareth, and there was a town called Nain, and as he was walking, there was a funeral procession. And it was a very sad funeral procession because it was a widow who had lost her only son. Now, uh, a widow uh, didn't have Social Security like we have. Huh? Her hope of being able to sustain herself was very, was very weak, and yet her son was a real source of, of hope. The husband was gone and all the others, and this was her only son. And Jesus came and stopped the procession, and he touched the bier, he touched the, 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 the conveyance that was carrying the body, and the son rose up. He came to life. He was dead, and he came to life. That's what we're about. We're about believing in the impossible that God can do that. Oh, think about the, the impossibility of Jesus dying on the cross. This is the, this is the epitome of hopelessness the epitome of everything turning completely upside down. But what was the response? The response of God the Father was that after the cruel scourging and the cruel hanging on the cross, the Father came and raised Jesus to life. And in that, it's, it's, the, it's the capstone, it's the, it's the epitome it's the power of faith in our life that no matter how hard things are, no matter what's going on in your life, the promise of resurrection is ours. And new life here, and new life with God forever in heaven.
I am very excited to tell you about a book that I've just written. It's a book for children, and it's a Christmas book. And it's called The Cow, the Wolf, and Lupe. It's the story of um, the little girl who was the daughter of the innkeepers in Bethlehem. The cow in the manger. No, you haven't thought about that. But the cow, she tells us exactly what happened. When all of a sudden the angels come and the, the singing comes, the shepherds run away. This book is going to cost $8 plus shipping and handling. And if you'd like to have the video of the program, it's another $2. Now please, get in touch, write us, and remember, you can call that telephone number right at the bottom of your screen. Make sure that you give this special gift to those little children that you love so very much. God bless you. I really value your, your phone call. I value your email. And I also value uh, your contact with the iPhone, my daily app. Uh, on the smartphone, I should say that, because that includes the iPhone and the Android system and also BlackBerry. Give it a look if you have one of those, please. It's I God Today. I God Today. But you have a great chance of getting in touch with me. And would you, would you pray with me over some of these special, special emails that I've got? I can't tell you where they came from. They come from all over the world, I guess. But dear Father Mike, thank you for being on the show this morning. Your words have really touched me. I've been going through a lot, but lately God has really been with me. Um, and for some reason, I know that when he is, that he is always around me. Whew, boy, that's what we hope we can convey to you. <laughs> Here's another, uh, Wanda, please pray for my debt and my niece, Tammy, she needs money. And I don't have that. And please pray that we can get some help soon. Ooh, this is all these dead-end streets. You know? Benjamin, I'm requesting prayer for God and Jesus, the favor to get hired to start a full-time um, psycho psychologist position at California, Los Angeles County, the Department of Mental Health. Oh, so many people struggling with, with not, not being able to use talents. You know? And here's a phone call from Michigan. Um, need prayers uh, to stop smoking. Ah, all these dead-end streets, brothers and sisters. Lord, open the doors. Allow miracles to happen with all of your love. And may Jesus' love for you always make you smile.